answer. Oh, I said that and now they're recording. Wonderful. Thank you. You see, you ask and you get. Got to ask, folks. Got to ask. All right. Don't be like Columbus and take. Okay, so uh, we're going to go through um, so overview of and journey into the history of the presence of Nipmuc people. Um, again, uh, we certainly could not go into all the different uh, uh, epistemologies of, uh, of, of Nipmuc people, uh, let alone any uh, culture that spans thousands of years, but I'm just going to give you a little insight on who I am and who our people are. And so, um, and uh, as I said, uh, let's see this, here we go. And that's me there. For those who don't know, I, I've been um, a storyteller, writer, and a uh, poet, and um, educated for over 30 years. And these are just some various pictures of me uh, doing programs um, uh, with youth around uh, the country. And uh, uh, there's a picture of me in Greenland there, uh, left corner, and uh, different tribal communities like Forest County, Potawatomi. And uh, of course, local libraries. I've, I've been to many events in Wellesley and, and all through that area there through the years. And, Maybe there's some folks on there who recall me coming to the libraries and schools and all through the area. So hi, hi if you're out there. Uh, and so, uh, and just before the pandemic, um, I was in Ecuador doing some programs at um, uh, Cuenca University, uh, 8,000 feet up. <laughs> that was an experience. Wow, driving up there and seeing landslides and wow, oh, just just an amazing. And um, and so that was just wonderful experience. And then uh, the pandemic hit and you know, full stop, right? And so um, I have um, been spending my entire adult, adult life sharing and teaching and um, mostly because of it was an, an, an awakening for myself. And uh, for those who have not heard my story, and again, I don't have time to go all into it, but I suffer deeply through this school system and through racism and through the segregations of the 70s and 80s. And uh, going to school as a kid here in Massachusetts was probably one of the worst experiences of my life. Uh, and I proudly say I didn't learn anything there that has benefited me until I actually went to college and began to learn things that were benefiting me. Um, and so, and, and this is part and parcel of the problem that our indigenous people have, ha have and continue to have throughout the country where we go through our entire life and we'll never see a Native American teacher. Uh, we'll never see somebody to model after. We'll never see somebody in the classroom that will represent us and speak for us and, and have that understanding of who we are. And, uh, you know, we are all gone through that. Um, and so and so because of the things that I experienced as, as through my childhood, and I, and I wanted to make that difference because it was um, uh, a really a bad time. And, and you know, and we see that these, these things continue to play out. And so that's been my life's mission to, to change, to help uh, our youth reclaim their identity reclaim their love of self and, and, and shift the narrative that, you know, you're not an outsider in that classroom. You're not just, you know, this, uh, uh, some kind of anomaly that even though they're treating you like that. Um, and so that's the work that a lot of us are trying to do now. And I think that's where Sam was getting to. Uh, and so we look at the tribe, again, the tribes of the Northeast woodlands have lived on this continent for thousands of years. Uh, even before the retreat of the last ice age, a society that adopted and evolved over a thousand of years culturally, spiritually, and polit politically that would go on to excel in science, cosmology, horticulture, ecology, and most of all, a connection with all living things that would all allow them to sustain a balance with everything around them. Um, you know, when, when, you know, going back to my childhood in school and, you know, they would have indigenous people believe that you are hapless bystanders benefiting from white proximity because the history doesn't include you, right? They never told you that without native people, there would be no industrial revolution because we know, right? What, what were the ingredients for the industrial revolution? Um, uh, petroleum, uh, rubber and steel. Well, two of those are indigenous inventions. Uh, um, they don't tell you that uh, the polyculture of indigenous uh, 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 science of growing things is far better than the monoculture. Um, they don't tell you that women's suffrage movement actually started with uh, the women of the East, East uh, in the Iroquois, uh, but they'll mention Stanton and us, but they never mention how it was, it was the indigenous women who inspired them. Um, uh, they don't tell you those things. And, and so we need to uh, uh, shift this narrative about uh, democracy, about freedom, uh, because 
when the Europeans first came here, they didn't even understand the kind of freedom that was already existing here for thousands of years. And so, so right here we have uh, Nipmuc, uh, us, the people of the fresh water, as you see there, this map kind of um, shows you our homeland. As you see, it encompasses four states. So originally, our, this is the original Nipmuc homelands, which encompass uh, in Massachusetts alone, 2000 square miles. That's not even counting what you see there in uh, Rhode Island and uh, uh, north, um, northeastern Connecticut there in north, uh, in uh, the tip of uh, southern New Hampshire. Um, by the late um, eight, uh, the 1900s, we were down to five acres of land that has never been ceded uh, in, in Hassanamissit in Grafton, Mass. That was the last reservation as a sign there. It says this land has never been owned by the white man. And it's true. Um, as you know, and I'll, I'll share a book that kind of lays out these uh, land transactions, we'll call them, you know, to use a euphemism, uh, that, that explains how this land was usurped time and time again. Uh, I currently live in Webster, one of the last reservations as well, the, the, the um, Pegan uh, Reservation area, as, it's, as it was called, uh, the homeland that was usurped as well, uh, through a, a federal violation called the Non-Intercourse Act, where the state of Massachusetts actually stole this land uh, by purchasing it from Indians, uh, my ancestors, illegally, where they weren't allowed to. And that still stands. So this is, uh, you know, we still have a, a crime in progress, as it were. Um, and so I want to share this here. And so, and one of the things I've learned through my decades of research and studying, we really, um, I, and I've learned quite a bit about my ancestors and it's just, and I'm never uh, uh, at a loss for being in awe for the things that are unturned. And, uh, and, and, and I say that after 30 years, we've learned quite a bit, but there's still a lot we don't know. And, and so now we're at the point where we can't really answer the question of how long indigenous people have been on this continent. And, uh, and we have to go back to what our ancestors taught us that we came from this place. We've always been here. And that is the best answer scientifically, uh, according to the data that they can kind of surmise at this point. Uh, and, and so, and with that said, we, nobody really knows how many people were here, but these are rough estimates that I'm showing you here on my screen, pre-contact. This is just uh, North America. We're not even talking South America. This is a roughly moderate, estimate 18 to 20 million people but by the time the 1900s were around censuses began to 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 uh be be taken place so we're doing censuses of the populations of the on-reservation indians and off res and so we know that by the 1900s there are quarter of a million uh native people uh where there was let's say 20 million uh that is a genocide rate like we have never seen on the planet Nowhere else in the world has a genocide rate of that percentage had, had taken place anywhere else. Uh, and you notice the correlation between 1803 and 1912, 32 states were added to the union uh, of the United States. Uh, and so every time a state was formed, where, where are the Indians going? You know, they're being killed. They're being pushed somewhere else. They're being, uh, uh, the children are being taken away to boarding schools, uh, uh, which, which we'll talk about in a minute. And so, I want to leave that there for a second, and and we I want to and we talk about that, and and we think about uh, a phrase that folks like to talk about is the U.S. Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Now, keeping those numbers in mind, I still have that up there. I want folks to consider that people of color, like myself, have not made use of the full benefit of the Constitution to as recently as 50 years. Now that is about 20% of the 245 years enjoyed by white, primarily land owning males, uh, citizens. Uh, for example, Native Americans were not full citizens until 1924. And it would not be until 1978 that Native Americans would have freedom of religion. Uh, the Re Freedom of Religious Act passed uh, public law 95-341 uh, in 1978. So that's, uh, that's 13 years after the civil rights movement and within my own lifetime. So I was born under a constitution without full access to all my rights as a citizen. And that drumming, like I just did, was a federal crime. Um, and it, it, it should be jarring to anybody to, to kind of just kind of reflect on that. Uh, not to mention the US constitution called a black person three fifths of a human 
And the Declaration of Independence, just 26 sentences after the, it declares, we hold all these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. It then refers to Native Americans as merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. Um, so then, taking that in fact that is written on paper, that documents that still stand to represent this country, um, you begin to see a different story unfold uh, of, of relationships and identities and experiences that are not uh, uh, conducive to the, uh, 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 the greatest country on earth, as it were, or, or, or the things that we say and, and things like that. And so, and so we could talk about what happened. Um, you know, the, the disruption and destruction of Native American culture has cataclysmic effects, disease, war, removal, erasure. And as you see here, this picture of um, uh, the Carlisle Indian Boarding School, uh, children who were taken in. And this has been in the news of late, which is really, um, really important. But if you're a native person, this has been on your mind all your life. Uh, uh, this has been on your mind all your life. And, and it's really good that it's coming to light. And, and we really need to keep talking about what happened. Uh, uh, this, this, this ethnic cleansing, this uh, 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 reprogramming that was uh, done to our, 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 uh, our ancestors. Um, and so, um, and this is one of my uh, favorite writers here, um, Gregory Cajate, uh, and he says, when indigenous worldview is forcibly changed, the tight woven fabrics of relationships unravels. People lose their understanding of themselves with their sense of place and are subsequently destroyed. Um, and so that, kind of goes without saying, but we need to keep saying it because people aren't always listening. And I like to share this here because this is not abstract for, for any of us indigenous people. And so, um, and another thing that they never teach us in school about the indigenous people in terms of their patriotism, right? If I, if I can use that word, uh, the Native American people are the highest, highly, high, most highest enlisted people in any military service per their ratio of population. So in other words, Native Americans are joining the military and serving this country more than any other group uh, 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 in America. And my family is no exception. Um, uh, I come from, I have two ancestors who were revolutionary uh, uh, war soldiers and 36 who are in the Union Army at the same time. And uh, I recently did, a, a Sam mentioned my play, a play entitled Freedom in Season. And, uh, and I've been talking about, so my great, great grandfather, Samuel Vickers was a Union Civil War soldier. And also he was there with his son. So my next grandfather in line was with him. And, uh, and I knew about him for many years, but as I did the research for this play I wanted to do about his life, we realized that there were 36 close relatives fighting at the same time. So when I, these documents that are in front of you are, are kind of showing that. And now and, uh, my grandfather, he was, he died in the Andersonville prison in, uh, the father, my other grandfather, uh, had to come back and talk about, tell that his son had died. And, and so it's a really heartbreaking story. And he was there with his cousins, uncles, and, and all these native men were, were signing up during that time where they weren't even citizens yet of the country. And uh, you see these documents there. So while he was there fighting, he was down in, uh, I think South Carolina, Whitehall, I think I, I have the records. Um, but you see in these documents and while he was away, his land was being usurped and his children were being taken away off to these boarding schools and farms. Uh, so I, I smiled to keep him crying, right? And, and so this is what the thanks he, he got for being down there. So uh, some kind of erroneous taxes, they take your land and then they take your children and you know, and this is how you're removed. And we have three generations of, of children who are removed from, their, from, our, from our homes. And the last one that was taken was my grandfather's oldest brother, uh, Arthur. And incidentally, my cousin Bernie, who's our family genealogist, he's the one that compiles a lot of this research. So I say, thank you, Bernie. Um, and so his, his grandfather, my grandfather's brother, who was, he was born in 1897. And because my grandfather was born in 1906, he had missed that period. But so, and we documented um, uh, my grandfather's uh, sisters before they passed, when they talked about how, uh, when their brother was let loose at the age of 20, when he comes home walking down the dirt road and how she dropped to her knees crying because she knew right away this boy was her brother who she hadn't seen. And, um, 
and yeah, so that's um really something that that story. And uh, right here, I'll share this. And so, a lot of this, what I'm sharing to you now, you can look this up. Uh, it's a book put together by uh, David Newmack, and it's entitled "From Mashin Tucket to Appomattox: The Native American Veterans of Connecticut Volunteer Regiments." And it also, and again, it also covers Massachusetts and Rhode Island uh, because all these folks are related, uh, the Native people there. Um, and so it's a really, really uh, fascinating um, uh, book that he put together there. And, and when I first got it, I'm looking in there, I'm seeing my relatives and it was pretty, pretty astounding. Um, so then, um, and so, and here's where we are, you know, we have a, a myth of America and a shared lived, lived experience. Um, let me try to move this here. George Erasmus, a respected Aboriginal leader from Canada said, where common memory is lacking, where people do not share in the same past, there can be no real community. Where community is to be formed, common memory must be created. Do we have a common memory in America? We have a myth of America and we have shared and lived experience. We have the myth of discovered lands, God's chosen people, exceptionalism, Freedom, opportunity, promised lands, expansion, and manifest destiny, land of endless resources. And on the other hand, you have the shared and lived experience of genocide, stolen lands, enslavement, forced removals, mascots, internment camps, boarding schools, institutional racism, segregation, erasure from history, Jim Crow laws, children taken at our border, and on and on it goes. So these two stories of America are not compatible. And arguably, the shared and lived experience story is not one that is uh, 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 shared too often. And um, there are many reasons for that. And uh, I like to show, and um, despite all we're still here, this is my great grandmother, Lucy Vickers, uh, and, and who was um, for lack of a better term, medicine woman. She knew plants as we like to say in our language. Um, and, and to the left is some of the archival stories that was archived in 1936. And this is a story they're talking about my great uncle, uh, how they used snake livers and, and different plants to cure. There was a white family who was uh, out there who had settled out in the Northeast Connecticut and they had chronicled the story. It was written in 1936, but taken earlier. And so these are really, these are really gems that have made it through time, right? That have survived much like our language and in, in, um, in different things that we, we continue to have. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen now for a minute. It's, um, so I want to just kind of um, go back again. And so I kind of, I gave you a lot there. And, and as you, and as you realize, everything I shared is, has, can expand in, in so many ways, right? Um, and so I, I just want to go back to the, to the question that we, we want to, um, we want to address, and that is why celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, I have no lofty reason why we should celebrate, but only the fact that we are still standing in the middle of an active crime scene. Everywhere we look, see, stand, is, is a result of genocide, forced removal, forced labor, and the result of empire building. And these are Hard things to, to say, uh, uh, well, I think they're even more harder for, for folks to kind of like, uh, kind of reflect on and, and see, see um, the results of, of how that got us here. Um, and so there is, there is no simple, simple way to, to, to rectify this. Um, we are about to have this indigenous, there's gonna be lots of dancing and celebrating and, and those are important, but we cannot take away the other piece of this, right? Uh, that the because non-native people are complicit in this story. They're a part of it. They're they're a part of it. So your part in this story is that reflecting uh, the people settler culture's part is reflecting on how we got to this point. Um, and for me, it's real simple. Uh, you know, we're <laughs> we are what five, over five centuries in, and um, we're asking the question: Should we should we acknowledge this just genocide now? Uh, it's it's really an embarrassment to ask that question, 
it's really shameful that we, it took so long. Uh, um, and it's and it's absurd when we think about how everything has been laid out. And I, I want to say, going back to what I mentioned about the Constitution, and they did their job well. They did their job well because this history has been hidden so much that we could say Happy Columbus Day and not blink, not seeing the implicit racism in it, that only when a white person shows up that it matters about who's on the land, that the black and brown people who are here, lives don't matter, that it would take a white person to come here and say, okay, now we have a land. The complicit, I would say explicit racism in that is off the charts. And we sit, we sit and we're, we're comfortable with that. We've normalized those kind of ideologies uh, and it's jarring, uh, you know, in, when you think about it. And, and, you know, in the experiences that, that um, have followed that. So it's easy to, to make a mascot and have an Indian doing silly things. It's easy to have all these phrases in, in like Pioneer Valley and, 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 and say all these microaggressive aggressive things without that go unnoticed because we've normalized racism. We've normalized bigotry. We've normalized uh, that native people are relics of the past. Um, and so we have, but despite all that, we are still here. Uh, uh, and so, uh, so when I think about indigenous peoples, that this should be a federal law and much like when Juneteenth was recently passed. And what I love about it, and there are different camps on this, right? In, in, uh, with indigenous scholars and leaders. But what I love about the idea of indigenous peoples day is education. The time for classrooms and people to talk about some of those things I just mentioned and much more. You have no idea the history that you're sitting on right now and the things that have taken place here because it's been hidden from you about the contributions of indigenous people. Like my ancestors walking 70 miles on their back with corn to feed starving settlers back in the 1700s. They don't tell you that. Um, and so the stories go on and on uh, about the, the, the Nipmuc presence, the, the, the healing, the cosmology. Uh, they made our skies Greek. They speak Greek now. They don't speak Algonquin. Our land is speaking English. The, the, the land is confused when it all spoke Algonquin. It spoke Nipmuc where it was supposed to. The ecology of the land, like I said, with the language. And so we've done a, a, quite a mess here. Uh, uh, and, and we are feeling the results of that uh, with, our, with all the different things that we're going, to, going through. Um, and I have to say, um, I'm 54. And uh, again, I've grown up, as I said, I grew up in segregation right here in Massachusetts and racism. And I'm, I'm experiencing things now that I thought I'd never see. And I'm very, I'm humbled and it brings me to tears. Um, when I travel to campuses across the US and other countries, especially US, and I, and I look across the, the classroom and I see people of all colors, of all backgrounds, of all ethnicities, in this, these 20s and 30 something students. And um, I want them to reflect that this is new. This is new, right? This is not something that happened before the 60s. And I want you to, to embrace that and realize that you guys are all part of this change, this revolution, this reckoning that is, that is taking place. And uh, I've been at this for decades, as I said, and I am so, I'm seeing things I thought I'd never see. Uh, and, and, I'm, and that goes with allyship, the accomplices, uh, the support of the Okitao Cultural Center. Uh, I am in, a, and I'm, and I think it's because, as I mentioned, that people are just coming to terms of like, what the blank are we doing here? What have we done? You know, the native people are still here. They're not going away. We tried everything. We're, we have the most powerful empire in the human history. We threw everything at them. They're still drumming. They're still speaking their language. They're still on their land. They just won't go away. We put them in boarding schools. And so we are, I think we're the conscience of this land and we're gonna be here. And, um, and we, are, we need to be centered in this conversation. When you wanna talk about immigration, if there are no natives at the table, the conversation has no integrity. If you wanna talk about diplomacy, if there are no indigenous people at the table, the conversation has no integrity. And on and on it goes. And so with that in mind, we need to come back and recognize these things. Um, and so, and I think indigenous people's day having that on the federal level is what's needed. And I encourage everybody to, to help make that happen. 
uh, because this is going to open up the doors for funding for these for the for the uh, ped pedagogy that we need to examine uh, what what happened here, and it's going to make us all better. Um, and I know sometimes when I when I have these conversations, people want to they want to run out the room, they want to throw things at me, they want to, but and it's not to make people feel bad, uh, to feel guilty. It's about having that place to heal, bringing that space about. Um, we all know if we do something wrong to somebody, we hurt their feelings and we harm them. If we don't give them time to space, uh, to, to, to space to heal, uh, then they won't. Instead of saying, uh, get over it, uh, it, that was a long time ago. And, and, you know, and we could say it's, it was not a long time ago because these things are still happening today that we're going through. Um, and I see it's just about uh, 7.55 and we're gonna go a little over if that's okay with you, everybody's all right. And, um, and again, as you see, I like to talk about these things and I can um, uh, mention a few other things, but I wanna pause here and uh, drink some tea and uh, answer some questions. And uh, we could just have a little conversation about some of the things I shared or some of the things you like to hear. So thank you all. And just as a reminder, if, if people have questions, um, you're welcome to type them into the Q&A function of Zoom. And um, the, the panelists here will read those aloud. And again, we'll try to get to as many as possible in our allotted time. Um, so Larry, one of the questions that had come in, um, which I think is kind of aligning with, with what you were just mentioning about getting involved, is um, what can non-natives do to support the indigenous communities? Okay, great, great, great question. I'm going to go back to my uh, share screen here. Uh, yeah, just okay. I'm gonna let me see. I have some books there I want to show in a minute, but is that I have one particular. Here we go. How to get involved. So um, here's um, here are some ideas of how to get involved. Um, and like I say, work local. Find out ways to support the tribe where you live. Uh, <laughs> everybody's out to get you today, man. You got to be careful. Um, so you'll get these envelopes of send money to the native charity somewhere, you know, where who knows where it is. Uh, and, and that's nice if you want to do that as long as you checked out the place. But it's always best to work um, work with the local tribes, uh, and because you'll see your money and your your effort, your sweat equity, whatever you want to put into that, uh, come alive. Uh, and secondly, support political actions that serve spiritual, culture, cultural, social justice of Indigenous people. Uh, we have a program, Stomp Out the Culture of Addiction. Uh, a lot of the work that I do, I didn't get to mention too much of that with uh, prevention. That's with uh, Cedric Woods. Uh, you can reach him at there. Uh, youth programs. Uh, and the Okiteo Cultural Center, uh, Nipmunk Cultural Preservation Trust. Um, and it's really about, um, again, seeing the world in a different light. And so I wanna, having said it, let me just show you this thing here. So the number one resource is Nipmunk people. And that would mean represent anywhere you are, uh, indigenous people in terms of finding out the information and, and working alongside them. But again, it's not all about them doing that work for you. It's about giving them that space and that center, giving them that center to, to speak. Um, and the combination of insightful research, which can undergo critical analysis and more importantly, be examined through an indigenous lens and worldview where outcomes can be measured that benefit the human ecosystems of knowledge of place. And so I say that, and I ask folks the question and probably It'll take too long of a process to answer, but I say to look at that picture and tell me what you see. And most folks will say, a eh, little boy on the beach. And then if I say, it's a little nipmunk boy and he's in the lake in Webster, Mass. Then you might say, oh, that's that's that big lake with the long name, um, tourist place and longest name in the dictionary. And, but now if you ask an indigenous person, a nipmunk person that, they would know that that's a, a Nipmunk sacred lake. And that's a very, very special place to our people. Um, and so instead of saying, well, it's a great place to go fishing, we're looking at that place to go pray and have ceremony. Uh, and so it's it's about uh, perspective. Okay, so that's kind of, 
the answer to that in terms of like uh, there's always places local to to seek out to work with folks. Okay. If any of the other panelists also have, uh, see any questions they want to pose to Larry, feel free to uh, pop in and unmute. Um, another question that had come in um, is for suggestions on how elementary schools can or should talk about Thanksgiving. Um, so I, as you mentioned, I have my book, The Morning Road to Thanksgiving. Uh, there are some resources coming out now. Um, uh, my friend uh, Chris Newell, I, I just recently wrote a book as well. I don't have the title to that book, but if you, you can look him up, uh, Chris Newell. Uh, and, um, and, um, but to get right to the heart of that question, it's important to tell them that story. And, um, and as I said, I've been an educator and a teacher for and doing this for 30 years. And, and usually how I handle it is um, uh, the story is commensurate to the age group, right? And so uh, if I was talking to a group of like high school kids, I would be probably very graphic in terms of telling some of the horrors. But when you're dealing with like kindergartners or first grades, I kind of kind of frame it like there were people who came here, they did horrible things to people just because of the way they looked, because of the color of their skin because of the way their hair and the kids will usually say, that's really silly. And I say, yes, I agree. And kids get that. Um, and so uh, that those are the kind of things that I, the way I kind of explain that to them. So there's a way of telling them that whole history, but just kind of tailoring it to their, to their understanding. I would also just add that the Committee for Indigenous Peoples Day Wellesley has been working on a, um, a book list of recommendations specifically for elementary schools. So once we have uh, that finalized, it'll be available on the um, IPD Wellesley website. Um, also, as a reminder, I popped in a bunch of links to all of the sites mentioned uh, in this event. And so um, those are also in the chat. I'm happy to repaste those in the chat as well. Um, and so another question that had come in, it seems to be a theme, um, is what can somebody do to learn more about the history uh, of this area from an indigenous perspective? Um, I would recommend my three books, Drumming and Dreaming um, and uh, Shameless Plug, right? But um, uh, seriously, uh, when you're, when all my books reflect this land, um, and so you would, you would gain, a, you would glean a lot of information about uh, the people here from reading those books. Um, and then I'll go back to my share screen. For some more his historical perspective, um, you might uh, have some books listed here that are really good for that, answering that question. Uh, here's one here, Donland Voices. Um, and you have many uh, indigenous people here who are part of that. And uh, especially this book here, uh, Our Beloved Kin, a good friend, uh, Abenaki Lisa Brooks. Uh, this story talks about uh, one of my ancestors uh, deeply, James the Printer, who was uh, he was um, noted noted for translating the first Bible on this land. Uh, he was one of the first students at the Harvard College. Many folks don't realize that uh, Harvard was the first Indian school, uh, the first brick building. And uh, James the Printer, or Waywas in our language, uh, he was one of the first students, as well as uh, Benjamin Larnell, who was a 16-year-old uh, called the uh, the first native poet, uh, uh, there's another term that they called him, but he was a, quite a phenomenon, but he died at a very young age. Uh, these were uh, scholars uh, of Harvard, uh, one of the first Indian schools. Uh, another book is, uh, uh, he's a non-native person. This is uh, Dennis Canole. I believe he passed a few years ago. It's a very insightful book of uh, uh, land, land transactions. Um, and this is, here's another book here written by Christine DeLuca, Memory Lands. Uh, she's another non-native person, but she spent some time with our folks um, uh, at attending some of our sacred paddles on Deer Island, which was uh, when our folks were forcibly removed to that land. And, um, and so we have, a, as you see, the books are a mix there of indigenous uh, writers and native writers. Um, and so, uh, and as we continue to move in this direction, and we're really hoping and, and, and and want to see our folks write our stories uh, as, as we see all these scholars come up in this next generation. 
So I know uh, we're close to time um, and I want to be mindful of everyone's time. So maybe, um, Larry, if I could ask you just a few more questions and then sure. to wrap it up. Um, so another question, let's just go scroll down to get back to it. Um, the question is, can you share your thoughts on um, or why it's important for white allies to boycott Thanksgiving and attend the National Day of Mourning in Plymouth? Um, so it's important the same way that allies need to support um, Indigenous Peoples Day. So we, we know once we do the research about the first Thanksgiving was a myth and uh, in 1637, the first official Thanksgiving that was uh, 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 mentioned was after the massacre of the Pequots. And so they were celebrating the, the murder of burning 300 to 400 men and women alive. Uh, and so that was the first uh, Thanksgiving that was officially uh, pro uh, under a proclamation in, in uh, Plymouth. Uh, and so, and it's good to remember that how these, the foundations of these, um, uh, these myths started. So it's, it's really important for allies to stand with indigenous people and, and accomplices who put their bodies out there in front because um, we know what the police do to us. And so we have our allies supporting us and I am tremendously humbled by that. And so, um, and uh, I remember many years ago, there was uh, an incident at, um, at, uh, at the, at the uh, in Plymouth where some of our, geez, this was probably in 1993 when some of my relatives, they were beating people up and folks went to jail and so, uh, yes, I um, I couldn't encourage it anymore. Yes. Um, so maybe just two more questions for you, Larry. Um, so another question that come in is, so many topics to address for Indigenous peoples, healthcare, Indigenous education, representation in government, etc. How do you prioritize what to address, and what are the most critical needs? The most critical needs is our most valued resources, our youth. Uh, and so addiction, uh, depression, uh, uh, um, health disparities are probably the first thing. And, and that, that all goes into the work that we do in terms of um, uh, uh, during the, some of the booklets I have here, like Circle Tied, to, Circle Tied to Mother Earth, because that's our future, right? And so uh, we, we call, sometimes we call it the big threes, depression, uh, alcoholism, and diabetes. And so they, and they all feel each other, you know, you get depressed, you eat, you eat, you, you drink and the, the drinking makes the sugars. And, and so, uh, and, and right here in Massachusetts alone, between 2014 and 2016, we had 24 overdoses and suicides within our native community. So we are losing one child a month for two years. Uh, and so, and I can't emphasize that enough. And it all goes back to some of the things I experienced as a kid of feeling left out, like you're not wanted, like you don't belong. And we know this because, the, 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 you know, we, we hear this from our youth and, and sadly, sometimes it's too late. And this is where addiction can creep in. And so, but I'm really proud to, to also mention that there are so many native indigenous young scholars out there taking, a, taking part in academic greatness while still getting involved in their culture. And so, and, and that would be the beauty of indigenous peoples day federally, right? Because we can deal with all of these issues, but that would be probably the foremost. Thank you, Larry. Okay, so um, there are, uh, there. I think there are a lot of educators in this because there are a lot of questions about curriculum. I could do a couple more if that's-, that's <laughs> Okay, yeah, great. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so another question that had come in is, sorry, I'm just kind of scrolling through to get back to it, is- um, uh, Okay, while you're doing it, I want to mention too, especially for all the educators out there, something really exciting. Uh, I'm also um, an artist in residence at Bunker Hill Community College, and uh, we are having our retreat actually this Friday. And one of the amazing things we're going to do there for the first time is that we are building an all Indigenous curriculum across disciplines from science, humanities, art, music, criminal justice. So every component of, of, uh, of pedagogy will have uh, an Indigenous component based on Massachusetts and, and Nipmunk folks. Uh, and so you, you mentioned like what different disciplines. So for example, we're talking biology, we may be talking about the polyculture of indigenous people. If we're talking criminal justice, we may be talking about sovereignty and land rights. If we're talking uh, 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 humanities, we may be talking indigenous spirituality. 
So it's really neat. And it's not going to be, as we say in elected, this is going to be part of the mandatory required courses, right, for them to graduate. So I applaud Bunker Hill. They're, they're taking the lead on this where you don't see this everywhere. So, and this is going to be required for, for graduation. So people are going to leave Bunker Hill learning a lot about indigenous people, uh, you know, because when these subjects are electives, they, they're a niche genre, right? Who goes to them? And so this is, and this is a part of that movement and that I'm excited to share. Thank you for sharing that. Um, if there are any uh, links to that curriculum or, or ways we can share that, happy to share that after this. Right. So we're, so right, we're in the process of building that now. And so part of this, uh, this uh, retreat we're gonna be having. And so over the next year, we're gonna be building that for, for, the, for, coming, for the coming years. Um, and as you know, it's gonna be some, some work and there'll be other scholar, native scholars involved. Uh, um, for, for example, Kim Frazier, who's an uh, Anishinaabe person. Her specialty is uh, uh, biology and science. So it's gonna be really cool. Um, so the question about curriculum um, or the classroom setting was any tips about navigating the line between appropriation and, appre and appreciation in a classroom setting? So I've heard that term before and I really don't know what the difference is. Um, um, and so, yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't really have an answer for that because um, I don't know where appro appropriation ends and appreciate, I think appreciation is when you invite the artist in or the indigenous person, or you ask their permission if you could share it. That's how it becomes that. But without their permission, without having them centered, then it's appropriation. And um, and uh, we were having this conversation the other day, and I think people. Uh, so there's two parts to that, right? So our ancestors taught us that all this medicine, these teachings, right, are for everybody, and we went with that. But then it was exploited. And now there's big money involved. And so people are constantly exploiting indigenous people, even their identity. People are making up that they're Indian and, and they're going off and, and they're not just any Indian. They're always a, a chief or, or they're, they're writing books. And, and it's, and it's uh, you know, we laugh and we see this all the time. They never just kind of like, okay, I have some heritage, but they always end up somehow at the top. And, and again, just the, how do I say this kindly, just their, this colonialism that's in them just can't stop. They just can't turn it off, even when they're trying to play Indian, right? Um, and so I really don't have an answer for that. Um, so another question that had been coming up um, is if you could speak a little bit more to um, some of your work with the Okateo Cultural Center. Yeah, so, uh, and as you know, Sam, you attended uh, the Okateo. So we are um, a cultural center that has uh, many parts to it. We are a safe place for our indigenous people to create uh, art, culture, music, dance, and also STEM, uh, do research um, uh, uh, and have many things. Uh, for example, I mentioned earlier, we just had our wilderness survival workshop. Um, and we also have uh, um, um, place-based learning sessions, which we do there again, uh, talking about prevention and healthy lifestyles. Uh, and so it's, it's a really important um, place. And, and by the way, uh, I need to mention, this is the first native run and operated indigenous center of all in all of central and western mass we're the first of its kind so i'm really excited to be a part of that um and again kind of like with idp you know what to, it took it so long and we know the answer right because we don't have the access uh cultural arts uh, uh equity and inclusion hasn't included us um and as an aside i, I do a lot of re research on culture equity and inclusion and, and i watch these videos and and i see a lot of the, the heavy hitters of people of color and different backgrounds we're sharing out these on these panels and very rarely I see one native person and they're not even mentioned in the conversation uh, and it's really astounding and they're talking about diversity equity and inclusion and no Indians are mentioned uh, and so we got work to do in that that respect and so um yeah and what was the question again <laughs> um really the question was if you could tell uh the attendees a little bit more about the center um, right, right. I got also, you. Also, if, uh, if there will be any other events that people could potentially attend or ways to support the center. Yeah, yeah. So I went, about, went on about how the indigenous component, but we also serve as an educational component where we have a living present series. And I invite you to the website. You'll see all the series there. And we discuss topics uh, from um, art and cult culture justice, the issue of mascots, uh, uh, education and indigenous studies of the school system. And so, and this is what we invited non-native people, um, uh, scholars, educators, and, and, and legislators to come in and sit in on these, on these talks. Uh, and, and so, um, and again, go to Okiteo. We just had an amazing uh, um, 
talk. Uh, we did a talk about Indigenous Peoples Day. We had a panel there, folks. Uh, Sam was there. And then just last uh, week, we had our art and, an art and cultural social justice panel. And we had um, Isaac Murdoch and, and uh, Jessica Lund. And for those who don't know these people, these are like the iconic folks in the, in the movement who um, uh, Jessica created the, 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 the woman with the hand over the mouth with the uh, symbol for the missing and murdered indigenous woman. And uh, Isaac created the other Thunderbird woman that is uh, very synonymous now with the Stop the Pipeline movement. So we're really honored to have those folks. And so we're doing this kind of work and, and, and um, uplifting their voices. And, um, and so as I get older and as I've done so many things, and, and as I said, my, I'm in pass it on mode. So I'm really excited to have Oki Taylor to uplift other artists. We have, we have two artists in residence right now. We're able to do that. And we're able to remunerate them through funding, through support of folks like you. Uh, because Native people need proper remuneration, and this is something that hasn't been done as well. And so we're really humbled that we're, we we can pay our artists, our Native artists. We have uh, an Oshnip Anishinaabe uh, young lady, and also one of our uh, local Nipmunk folks there. And so it's it's really exciting what we're, we're part of, and it's it's all cutting edge stuff because it's never been done before. And um, and we have to give a big shout out to Double Edge Theater who've been supporting us all the way. So yeah. So um, as Larry was speaking, I added some links to the Okateo website and then also a link directly to the Living Present series. As Larry mentioned, I attended one of them and um, it was a, an amazing learning process. It's a beautiful facility. Um, so I encourage you all to look at that website and find ways to connect. Um, so Larry, maybe if I could ask you one more question and then we can wrap it up for the evening. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and this is a question that um, I think was addressed as well at um, the Living Present series on Indigenous Peoples Day at the Okoteo Center, which is, uh, what are your thoughts on organizations starting public events with land acknowledgements? I, I, I agree. I think it's good. And, um, and as you mentioned, Sam, we, we need to have those action steps. So if you're doing a land acknowledgement, make sure you have the action steps part of that because just saying the words we need that physical action we need that uh action in motion right so the, and, and they're they're important and uh, and again i um there were different views on it in certain uh indigenous corners but i i loved it because as i said i you know my my kindergarten first and third grade teachers and you know they they would pull my hair and treat me really bad and it called me savages and you know, so to have an educator stand up and say, this is your land, I, I, it, brings, it makes me want to cry, right? It's like, yeah, finally. So I, it's important. It's a big deal because acknowledge is the, is the beginning to accountability. Uh, and, and so it, it starts shifting consciousness. You know, I lived up in Treaty 4, Saskatchewan for a while, and Canada's been doing this for a while throughout Canada. Uh, uh, you know, so they, they've been doing this for some time now. And of course, they have their issues up there. but um, many of the institutions there, universities, schools are already starting off uh, their programs with land acknowledgements. And I encourage, don't just do it when Indians are coming. Uh, do it all the time. <laughs> um, so with that, thank you, Larry, so much for your time. Thank you all attendees for joining and uh, staying into the very end. Um, if you all have questions or are looking for more information, those links that I put in the chat are very helpful, great resources to uh, reconnect with. Um, and so, yeah, with that said, I just want to thank everyone for joining. Um, thank you, Wellesley Free Library, for co-hosting this event. Thank you, Joan and Dave, for also joining as well and sharing your thoughts. And of course, thank you, Larry, for your time. Thank you, thank you all so much. And thank you all for listening. And I really appreciate this time. And to learn more about what I do, again, go to the okitail.org uh, website and You'll see all the doings and happenings there. And please get involved if you can. Uh, I thank you for your time. Thank you, Sam, uh, Wellesley Library, Kara, Jane, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. I did just want to say for those attendees that are still here, I am going, I just sent out an email with all the links that were shared in the chat and all the book titles for everyone. So hopefully you get it. And I, um, you can always reach out to the library and we can share all of those resources with you again. Thank you. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sam.
Thanks, Kara. Good night, everyone. Have a great night. Good night. Thanks, guys. That was wonderful. That Thank was you, John.